Hello students. <clears throat> Today we're going to talk about uh, the fluids in the body with electrolytes and acid-base balance. Chapter 27. The fluid compartments in the body uh, contain the flu fluid, water, as well as electrolytes. <clears throat> there are two basic compartments, fluid compartments in the body that exchange water and electrolytes and other solutes. That's the fluid that's on the inside of cells called intracellular fluid. And then all the fluid that's on the outside of the cells, which is called extracellular fluid. And the extracellular fluid could really be subdivided into the fluid called interstitial fluid, which is the fluid on the outside of cells and tissues. And then the fluid portion of blood that we learned a while back called plasma. This is just a little overview of the anatomy of fluids in the body. You can review that. Um, <clears throat> as far as the fluid compartments are concerned, you can see that uh, two-thirds of the fluid, all fluid in the body, uh, is on the inside of cells, the intracellular fluid. Um, about one-third of all the fluids on the outside of all the cells in the body, which is subdivided into 80% of that in interstitial fluid, and then 20% of that is in the plasma of the blood. So this is just a little graphic demonstrating uh, the shifts in fluid from one compartment to another one. Here we have a little blood vessel. So fluid and solutes, electrolytes can pass back and forth out of the plasma at capillary beds into the extracellular fluid of tissues. And the fluid and electrolytes and sol other solutes can go in and out of the intracellular fluid of the cells in the tissue and back to the extracellular fluid. So this is just showing the, the fluid movement from the plasma to the extracellular fluid to the intracellular fluid and vice versa. As far as the regulation of fluid or water in the body, typically controlled by several things. We eliminate excess water via salt loss, uh, urinary salt loss. When we, ex when we uh, excrete salt in urine, water follows that. So our kidneys can lose some fluid if we have too much water in our body. And that way, the kidneys help regulate the water volume in the blood. On the other hand, if there is not enough water in the blood, the kidneys can save water, which we talked a little bit about that in the renal chapter. There are two main solutes in urine uh, that is involved with allowing water to follow them, and that's sodium and chloride ions. So as the kidneys excrete sodium and chloride, water is going to follow it. Remember, wherever sodium goes, water is sure to follow. So if the kidneys are reabsorbing sodium, it's going to reabsorb water. If the kidneys are excreting sodium out in urine, <clears throat> the kidneys will also dump water out along with that sodium. So here's a little table of some hormones that we discussed <clears throat> several times this semester that help regulate water um, <clears throat> along with where the thirst center is located. The thirst center is located in the hypothalamus. And when we are dehydrated, the hypothalamus is stimulated to make us uh, desire to drink fluids, water. So we gain water through uh, trying to quench our thirst by taking water in. Remember, antidiuretic hormone, which is also known as vasopressin, is released from the posterior pituitary gland. When the osmolarity of the blood is high or you're dehydrated, um, it is stimulated also by the sympathetic nervous system. It's also stimulated by angiotensin II. And antidiuretic hormone acts on the kidneys, specifically at the end of the distal convoluted tubule and in the collecting ducts. And it causes those cells, the principal cells there, to incorporate aquaporin II channels, which makes those cells more permeable for water movement. So antidiuretic hormone causes these cells to reabsorb more water and thus decreases urinary output volume 
but increases our blood volume and helps maintain blood pressure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Aldosterone is produced by the zona glomerulosa of the adrenal cortex. It has two major stimulations. One of them is angiotensin II, stimulates <clears throat> the glomerulosa cells to release aldosterone, and high levels of potassium ions, which is called hyperkalemia, also stimulates aldosterone release. So aldosterone targets the kidneys as well, the kidney as well at the distal convoluted tubule and <clears throat> the collecting duct. And it promotes those cells to reabsorb more sodium. And by reabsorbing more sodium, remember, water is going to follow that. So we, aldosterone causes the kidneys to reabsorb more sodium and water, which decreases urinary output volume, but increases blood volume and helps maintain blood pressure. <clears throat> Atrial natriuretic peptide is produced by the cells in the posterior wall of the right atrium. It's released when, excuse me, it's released when there is too much blood volume, which means the blood pressure is probably high, and that extra blood volume stretches the wall of the right atrium, and it releases atrial natriuretic peptide. A and P, it uh, targets the kidneys and promotes the loss of sodium in urine, which is called natriuresis. So you see that word right here. And atrial natriuretic peptide, as we learned in, in the renal chapter, also increases glomerular filtration rate so that the filtrate moves through the renal tubule more quickly and water then can be lost in urine. That brings, so it increases urinary output volume, but it brings your blood volume back down to normal. So just review these hormones. We talked about them before. I left this power, uh, this slide in the PowerPoint just as a review, but we still need to know what they do, those hormones. <clears throat> now let's talk about water intoxication. I don't know if you ever heard about that before, but you can have too much water in your blood. When we have too much water in our blood, it decreases the blood osmolarity. And which means the blood is very dilute and it can cause water to shift from the blood into cells. So if I go back up to this picture real quick for a second, if we have too much water in the blood, the blood becomes hyper hypotonic. If you remember that term uh, from general biology, it, be it becomes hypotonic relative to the extracellular fluid around all the cells and more water will leave the blood and then enter the cells, which is not good because the cells then start to swell up with water. So that's called water intoxication. When we have too much water in the blood relative to the solutes in the blood. So here's a little flow chart you should review if you, if you don't never learned anything about water intoxication. If we have excess blood loss, or we're sweating or vomiting or diarrhea, and we then try to incorporate more water in our body that is just plain water. That means you're replacing your water <clears throat> with just plain water and not electrolytes. That's what leads to this problem. Consider a marathon runner. If a marathon runner runs a race, and at the end of the race, they just drink a whole bunch of plain water all at one time, all of that plain water dilutes the blood, dilutes the plasma, the solutes in the plasma. That leads to water intoxication. What you're supposed to do if you're dehydrated is replace both electrolytes and water. That's why you're not supposed to just drink plain water when you're severely dehydrated. So <clears throat> when that happens, this excess intake of plain water decreases the sodium concentration in the blood and uh, which is called hyponatremia, um, and in extracellular fluid, it decreases the osmolarity then of that fluid. There's going to be an osmosis or movement of water from the extracellular fluid into the intracellular fluid, which causes the cells to swell up. Now consider the neurons in the brain. This is where uh, many of the, the problems come from. The neurons in the brain start to swell. 
and they don't function properly, which leads to the symptoms of water intoxication, which include mental confusion, seizures, coma, and even death. So it's a fairly severe uh, event, physiological event, when there is excess plain water in the blood. So you never want to replace just plain water when you're dehydrated. You also need to replace your electrolytes that are lost. And so these are the, just the, some of the main ways that we lose water out of our body. Now, as far as the electrolytes in the, in the blood are concerned in the, in the body, they're measured in what's called milliequivalents per liter. And that's what this unit is over here that you see, milliequivalents per liter. So the milliequivalents per liter just allows us to know what the electrolyte concentrations are in our blood. Uh, and typically, we can uh, determine what's going on with our water movement and acid-base balance and other physiological events in our body with disruptions of these electrolytes. So let's go through some of them. <clears throat> Sodium, which is Na, is an, a cation. It's a positively charged ion. It's the most abundant cation in extracellular fluid. For that reason, if any cell opens a, a sodium channel, sodium always wants to enter the cell down its concentration gradient. Sodium is responsible for nerve transmission, action potentials in, in nerves, neurons I should say, in muscles. It's involved in fluid and electrolyte balance in the body. And it's regulated by aldosterone, ADH, and atrial natriuretic peptide, ANP. Remember, aldosterone causes more reabsorption of sodium. ADH actually controls water reabsorption, but sodium is going to be reabsorbed along with the water. And ANP does the opposite. ANP causes the kidney to lose sodium in urine and water will follow it out and that's why A and P kind of acts like a diuretic even though they don't say that. Chloride is the mo uh, most abundant or major uh, anion in the extracellular fluid. So chloride is involved in regulating the osmotic pressure or what I was just referring to as uh, osmolarity between the fluid compartments, extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid. Chloride is a major component of the stomach acid that you learned in chapter 24, hydrochloric acid. And chloride is controlled by aldosterone. So aldosterone basically causes the kidney to reabsorb more sodium as well as more chloride, and, then, and thus indirectly water, because where sodium and chloride goes, water is going to follow it. <clears throat> Potassium is the most abundant cation in the intracellular, intracellular fluid. For that reason, when a cell opens a potassium channel, potassium always wants to leave the cell and enter extracellular fluid. Potassium is involved in fluid volume balance. It is a major ion involved in neuron and muscle action potential generation. Here I put impulse conduction. It's involved in muscle contraction and helps regulate pH. Uh, which I'll, I don't know if I have that picture in here, but I'll talk about it when I get the pH in a minute. The mineralocorticoids, mainly aldosterone, is what regulates potassium balance. So, but, uh, aldosterone causes for a reabsorption of sodium in the kidney, but at the same time, it causes the kidney, specifically in the distal convoluted tubule and in the collecting duct, to excrete potassium out in urine to make the kidney dump more potassium out. So our kidneys are basically set up to reabsorb more sodium and to excrete more potassium. Bicarbonate is the most important anion in plasma. And we have to talk about this at the end of the packet. Bicarbonate is a major buffer of pH in our body. It's one of the major buffering systems in our body to help balance pH. The kidneys reabsorb or secrete more or less bicarbonate in order to help regulate acid-base balance. And that's what we're going to talk about when we get down to acid-base balance in a second. 
Calcium is the most abundant of the cations in the extracellular fluid. It is a major component of bone and teeth, as we learned in AMP1. It is responsible for allowing the chemical reactions to occur that causes blood clotting or blood coagulation. It is responsible for allowing neurons to release their neurotransmitters. It is responsible for triggering muscle contraction and maintaining muscle tone. And it allows nerves and muscles to generate action potentials and just for them to work. The level of, of uh, calcium in our plasma is regulated by parathyroid hormone that we learned about. Parathyroid hormone, or PTH, target, it does really three main things, but it makes the bone release calcium in the blood, it makes the kidneys reabsorb more calcium, it makes the kidney produce calcitriol, which is the most active form of vitamin D, and calcitriol targets our intestinal cells to reabsorb to absorb calcium from our diet. So in all of the effects of parathyroid hormone, we're trying to increase our blood calcium levels. Phosphate is uh, the major anion <clears throat> in fluids that is used as a buffer. It is also regulated by parathyroid hormone and calcitriol. But whereas parathyroid hormone and calcitriol are trying to get blood levels of calcium high, parathyroid hormone and calcitriol tells the kidney to excrete out in urine phosphate. We don't want a whole lot of phosphate in our blood that can get toxic. So PTH and calcitriol increase calcium in our blood, but it decreases phosphate by causing the kidneys to excrete it out in urine. So just review these uh, few ions that I have here. Uh, there's some tables in your book you can look at if you get a little bit better idea of the importance of them if they're too high or they're too low. Now, we have to get into acid-base balance. Dealing with the pH of the body fluids. The pH range of blood is 7.35 to 7.45. It's a very tight physiological limit. So that is to say that if the pH of the blood falls below 7.35, we become acidic or we're in what's called acidosis. If the blood pH range goes above 7.45, that means that we are alkaline or basic in what we call alkalosis. So we have to stay within that range, 7.35 to 7.45. So there's mechanisms set in place in our body to help maintain a normal blood pH in that range. There are things called buffer systems, and we're going to look at those. Our lungs help maintain regular pH of our blood by getting rid of carbon dioxide. When you exhale carbon dioxide, you basically are getting rid of acid. And our kidneys are set up to excrete acid in the form of hydrogen ion out into what becomes urine. So there are a couple of ways why, a couple of reasons why our blood pH is more alkaline. So 7.35 to 7.45 is, is somewhat of an alkaline pH if you think about the pH scale. Seven is neutral, below seven is acidic, above seven is, is basic. Well, our normal blood pH range is in the basic range of the pH scale, 7.35 to 7.45. So one way that our body maintains that is by excreting acid out in urine. And that's how the kidneys are involved in regulating pH in part. So urine typically is more acidic than our blood plasma because we're always trying to dump acids out in urine. So let's go through some of the buffer systems. There are three principal buffer systems in the body. The first one which is really the most abundant of all the buffer systems, is referred to as the protein buffering system. So let me explain to you first of all briefly what a buffer is. A buffer is a substance that has the ability to, to do one of two things. A buffer can release hydrogen into solution. 
if the solution or fluid is too alkaline. If it's too basic, a buffer can release hydrogen, which is acid, into the fluid and it'll bring the pH back down. On the other hand, if the blood pH falls too low and becomes acidic, a buffer can soak up or absorb hydrogen out of solution and that way the acid gets buffered onto or bound to the buffering mo molecule. For instance, here is a typical amino acid. You don't have to memorize this structure or really the chemical equation, but what you're looking at here is this. This part of an amino acid, that, and all amino acids make up proteins, if you remember that. All amino acids have this one structure in common. From here, all the way around here is the same in all 20 amino acids. This is called the amino group. This is the central C, or central carbon, with a hydrogen off of it. And this is a carboxyl group. This is a carbon with a double bonded O with an OH coming off of it. This is called a carboxyl group. So this is the amino group. This is the carboxyl group. The carboxyl group in organic molecules is an acid. They're really what we call a carboxylic acid. So an amino acid is called amino acid because it has an amino group on it and it has an acid group on it over here. So the only place that changes in this molecule for all 20 amino acids is what's called an R group. This is not an atom. This is just a group. It could be a string of atoms. It can be a ring of atoms. So this R group is different in all, all amino acids. So let's say that the pH was too high and it was alkaline. This amino acid, specifically from the carboxyl group, can get rid of this H and secrete it into solution and that's what we're seeing here. So you see over here, this amino acid becomes ionized. It becomes an anion and in which case it released a hydrogen in solution and hydrogen is acid. So if we need to bring our pH down or to make it more acidic, we, our buffers will release acid into solution. And that's what this H represents. So that's the protein buffering group. So we have a lot of proteins in our blood. Uh, one we learned about was hemoglobin. So let's, uh, first of all, let's look at what happens uh, if the blood pH is too low. So if the blood pH is too low, the same amino acid on proteins can act as a buffer by absorbing the extra acid. So here's the extra acid causing the pH to be low. It will bind to the amino group and also add a charge to it. So this amino acid also becomes charged, but it becomes a cation. So it absorbs that, that acid and pulls it out of solution, and it will bring the pH back up since it was too low to begin with. So let's talk about hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a protein. So technically it is part of the protein buffering system. So if you recall back when we talked about the respiratory system, respiratory physiology, hemoglobin has the ability to bind hydrogen. And it works this way. Inside the red blood cell, so all of this chemistry goes on on the inside of a red blood cell. Inside the red blood cell, water combines with carbon dioxide in the presence of the enzyme called carbonic anhydrase, which is not shown. It catalyzes this step to produce carbonic acid. Now this carbonic acid is going to split up in solution in water to two things. It's going to split up into hydrogen ions, which is the acid part, and then bicarbonate. This HCO3 minus, this anion, is called bicarbonate. It's a pretty important buffering molecule in our body. But what happens with the hydrogen? Well, to prevent the blood from becoming too acidic every time hydrogen is being released from carbonic acid, that hydrogen actually can combine to hemoglobin, specifically oxyhemoglobin. That's hemoglobin that is saturated with oxygen. When hydrogen binds to hemoglobin, 
it actually kicks off the oxygen and it releases oxygen so it can go to the tissue cells to be used for aerobic respiration. So if you recall in respiratory physiology, a low pH environment decreases hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen, which increases oxygen dissociation. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. So this is acid. When it binds to hemoglobin, it kicks oxygen off and the oxygen can go to the cells so the cells can use it. And hydrogen is being buffered. So it's not involved in reducing the pH because it's bound to hemoglobin. Now the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffering system is one of the most important buffering systems in the body. It basically works this way. If our blood pH falls too low and we become acidic, there's a lot of acid or hydrogen in the blood or body fluids and hydrogen then can bind to HCO3 minus which is bicarbonate and when it, hydrogen binds to bicarbonate it reforms carbonic acid. On the other hand carbonic acid has the ability if the pH is too high or we're alkaline has the ability to release a hydrogen into solution and thus bring the pH back down. So let me go over that one more time. This is a reversible reaction. Hydrogen can combine with bicarbonate, which means it's being buffered, it's pulled out of solution, and it forms this acid. That will take and bring our pH back up. The more bicarbonate we have to absorb acid, or H, will help bring your pH up. For that reason, if you have a patient and they are in acidosis, the doctor might order you to hang an IV bag of sodium bicarbonate. When you put sodium bicarbonate in your patient, the sodium breaks away or dissolves away from bicarbonate. You're putting more bicarbonate in their blood and that bicarbonate you're putting in their blood soaks up or binds to this hydrogen or pulls the acid out of solution and it brings your patient's pH back up to normal. On the other hand, if your patient is in alkalosis, the, the carbonic acid in the body fluids can release hydrogen back to solution and that will bring the pH back down, make the fluid more acidic. So this is a reversible reaction where hydrogen can be released and bring the pH down or hydrogen can be absorbed by bicarbonate to bring the pH back up. All right, the last of the buffering systems include the phosphate buffering system. The phosphate buffering system involves really two phosphate ions. The first one here is dihydrogen phosphate. I mentioned this in chapter 26, along with monohydrogen phosphate. These are phosphate ions, they're complex ions, they're anions, and they go through a series of reactions where they can buffer acids or bases in the blood. So let's say that um, our blood pH is uh, too high. Hydroxide ion, which is a base, can bind to phosphate, dihydrogen phosphate. In so doing, it will cause the production of water and monohydrogen phosphate. So in this way, we're buffering the pH in our blood by getting rid of a base. And as far as the acid is concerned, if the pH is too low and we have too much hydrogen in the blood or in our fluid, the hydrogen then can bind to monohydrogen phosphate and by adding hydrogen to mono, monohydrogen phosphate, you produce dihydrogen phosphate. But this hydrogen now is not part of uh, the acid that's in the fluid because it's bound to the phosphate. That's what buffers do. They can either soak up the acid out of solution or they can release it back into solution. Now, 
I will say this, once this hydrogen binds to monohydrogen phosphate, it's being pulled out of solution, which means the pH is, of the solution is going to come back up. Now let's get into the organ systems that regulate blood pH. Our lungs and our kidneys, which I'll mention in a minute, our lungs and our kidney are the two organ systems in our body that regulate pH at the organ level. So the way that our lungs regulate pH is by manipulating how much carbon dioxide is being exhaled out. For instance, this is the carbonic acid cycle. It is a reversible reaction. If in a forward direction this way, which happens at internal respiration that we talked about in chapter 23. Carbon dioxide combines with water in the presence of carbonic anhydrase. That's the enzyme that catalyzes this step. Carbonic anhydrase combines CO2 and H2O together to form carbonic acid. Carbonic acid, being an acid, dissolves in fluid into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. So, if our blood pH starts to fall and we become acidic, our lungs will try and restore blood pH by getting rid of more CO2. And in order to do that, this reaction has to run in the reverse direction. So as the blood is entering our lungs, if we start to breathe faster and deeper, bicarbonate will bind to hydrogen to reform carbonic acid, which is broken down into CO2 and water by carbonic anhydrase, the enzyme not shown, and this is what we exhale out. So the more we exhale CO2 out, the more hydrogen we are removing from fluid. So the more this reaction runs in this direction, we are getting rid of acid by exhaling out CO2. So if we're acidic, we want to hyperventilate. However, if we are alkaline, we don't want to breathe very fast. We don't want to exhale out all of our CO2. We want to respire more slowly to retain more CO2 in the blood, which maintains the acid in the blood. So here is the negative feedback loop for the regulation of respiration dealing with pH. So if you remember, and here we have a decrease in our blood pH, which means we're increasing hydrogen ion concentration. So when we have a decreased blood pH, we have receptors called chemoreceptors located in the brainstem. There they're called central chemoreceptors in the brainstem. And we have peripheral chemoreceptors in the carotid sinuses and the aortic arch. These chemoreceptors detect when the pH falls or we become acidic. Nerve impulses to the medulla oblongata, where the dorsal respiratory group is located, causes the dorsal respiratory group to send signals to our diaphragm and our external intercostal muscles where they contract more forcefully and more often, which means we start to breathe deeper and faster. And as we breathe more deeply and faster, we exhale out more CO2. And as we're exhaling that CO2 out, if I go back to this equation, the reaction is running to the left, running to the left. And we're getting rid of CO2 and we're getting rid of our acid. So acid in the blood is linked to how much CO2 is in the blood. If we have too much CO2 in the blood, we're acidic. If we don't have enough CO2 in the blood, we're basic. So this is a negative feedback loop. It's going to run and run and run. And when your blood pH is back to normal, you start breathing normally again. Now, as far as the kidneys are concerned, the kidneys do two things for us to help regulate pH of our blood. The kidneys are involved in excreting acid out in urine. So there's something called a, a volatile acid and something called a non-volatile acid. Volatile acids are things like carbonic acid. This is a volatile acid because it's converted to a gas that we, we can exhale out or gas off out of our body. 
Non-volatile acids are acids like lactic acid, phosphoric acid, hydrochloric acid. All of those are non-volatile acids because they're not turned into a gas for us to exhale out. So the kidneys can excrete more hydrogen from non-volatile acids out in urine. It does so in two places of the renal tubule. It does so in the proximal convoluted tubule with, if you remember in chapter 26, the antiporter called the sodium hydrogen antiporter is located in the proximal convoluted tubule. So those transporters of the proximal convolu convoluted tubule cells can secrete more hydrogen out into what becomes the filtrate. What is the filtrate? Or here I put tubular fluid. So that's going to be lost in urine. The kidneys also, though, have the ability to reabsorb bicarbonate so let, in order to buffer acids in the blood. So let me, let me just go over this picture with you and make sense of this for you. Here, CO2 and water combine together in the presence of carbonic anhydrase to form carbonic acid, which splits up into hydrogen and bicarbonate. Now, in order to maintain a more alkaline pH, 735 to 745 of our blood, this hydrogen is going to have to be excreted out into what will become urine. This is the, the filtrate in the tubule lumen in the kidney. So this is an active transporter. These cells are called intercalated cells that we learned about in chapter 26. And these transporters are active transporters using ATP to actively pump hydrogen up its concentration gradient in order to make the urine more acidic. So if we are acidic, if our blood pH is too low, the intercalated cells excrete more acid out in urine to get rid of it out of the blood. But on the other hand, if we are acidic, if our blood pH is too low, the kidneys also reabsorb more bicarbonate. So by reabsorbing more bicarbonate, that bicarbonate can buffer the acid in the blood and thus bring your pH back to normal. So here's another reason why chloride is so important. This is called the chloride bicarbonate exchanger and is found in many different cells of the body and red blood cells here in the cells of the, of the kidney. And bicarbonate, when it moves through the channel or the transporter, chloride comes in. So we exchange one anion for another one. So chloride is involved in helping maintain acid-base balance. So by reabsorbing more bicarbonate, we buffer the acid in the blood that brings our blood pH up. And by excreting more acid out in the form of hydrogen, the urine becomes more acidic and we're removing that from the blood. Well, I know they don't show that coming from the blood, but CO2 and water, ultimately CO2's, you know, the cells making CO2 combines with water, we can get rid of, of hydrogen in that way. Now, the hydrogen in urine is not being lost in urine as a free hydrogen the buffers exist in urine as well and what becomes urine there's the ammonia and the phosphate buffering system ammonia is a nitrogenous waste product from the deamination of proteins it's a toxic molecule and in urine hydrogen will bind to it to form NH4 which is a cation this is called ammonium ion this is an irreversible binding. So as soon as hydrogen binds with ammonia, you form ammonium ions, and that's going to be lost in urine. Here, the monohydrogen phosphate molecule we just talked about combines with hydrogen to form dihydrogen phosphate, which also is irreversible here. And we're going to lose that, that acid out in urine bound to dihydrogen phosphate. Now, I put here a table that has uh, the various uh, mechanisms in place for regulating blood pH. It's just a quick overview what the buffer systems do, the proteins in the blood and around the body like in blood cells, the carbonic acid bicarbonate system that we just talked about, and all the way down through the kidneys, and, uh, uh, the lungs and the kidneys. So just review what is in this table. Make sure you know the, the important parts of this and I'll talk about what happens with the primary acid-base imbalances right now. So,
First of all, if the blood pH is below 7.35, that's called acidosis. If the blood pH is above 7.45, it's called alkalosis. Those are the generic names. We're, someone can be in acidosis, they can be in alkalosis. The four principal or primary acid-base imbalances include what is referred to as respiratory acidosis or respiratory alkalosis, metabolic acidosis or metabolic alkalosis. So here's how this works. In order to determine if the acid-base imbalance is due to the lungs or the respiratory system, we have to know what the concentration of carbon dioxide is in the blood. If the CO2 levels are high or low, and that's what's causing the pH imbalance, it would be called a respiratory acidosis or alkalosis. And I'm going to tell you how it go, which way it goes in a minute. If our pH imbalance is due to the fact that we either don't have enough HCO3 in the blood or if we have too much of it in the blood, then it's referred to as a metabolic acidosis or metabolic alkalosis. So in respiratory acidosis, the blood pH drops because there's an excess amount of CO2 in the blood, which leads to an excess production of acid. This is carbonic acid. And remember, carbonic acid dissociates to release a hydrogen in the blood, which starts to make the blood more acidic. So I'll give you a for instance. If you have a patient and they're not breathing, or they're breathing very slowly, not breathing correctly, they're not going to be exhaling enough CO2 out. And if you're not exhaling your CO2 out, it's being retained in the blood. And if we retain more CO2 in the blood, it forces more carbonic acid to be produced, which brings the blood pH down. We become acidic. So by the respiratory system failing to get rid of CO2, exhaling CO2, for whatever reason, it's called a respiratory acidosis. So in respiratory acidosis, the pH would be low and the CO2 would be high. And I'll tell you what the numbers are in a second. It would be above 45 millimeters of mercury of pressure. So in respiratory alkalosis, it's the exact opposite. In, in respiratory alkalosis, the pH is higher than normal, so it's above 7.45. And that means we got rid of too much CO2 out of the blood. And that happens when you hyperventilate. So I don't know if you ever hyperventilated and you got kind of lightheaded. That's due to the fact that your blood pH went up. It became alkaline. And you induced in yourself respiratory alkalosis. On the other hand, if you hold your breath as long as you can, the reason why you end up needing to breathe again is not because you're running out of oxygen. It's because you're inducing a respiratory acidosis. By not breathing, CO2 is building up in the blood, which builds up acid in the blood, and you're becoming acidic. Now, as far as the kidneys are concerned, metabolic acidosis is when you don't have enough HCO3 or bicarbonate in the blood. If our bicarbonate levels are low and your pH is low, then you have metabolic acidosis. So if you don't have enough bicarbonate, you can't buffer the acid in the blood and you become acidic, in which case we call it metabolic acidosis. On the other hand, if we have too much bicarbonate in the blood, it soaks up more acid out of the blood and it makes your pH rise. So when the pH starts to go up, you become alkaline. And if it's due to the fact that HCO3 is too high, it's called metabolic alkalosis. All right, so let's go through the numbers real quick. In respiratory acidosis and alkalosis, it is due those Acid-base imbalances are due to an abnormal amount of carbon dioxide in the blood. And the amount of CO2 in the blood is called the PCO2, the partial pressure of CO2. The high end of CO2 in the blood is 45 millimeters of mercury of pressure. The low end of CO2 in the blood is 35 millimeters of mercury of pressure. 
If the CO2 level in the blood goes above 45, you then are in respiratory acidosis because the pH of the blood dropped below 7.35. So if you are not breathing or breathing slowly, CO2 builds up. The partial pressure rises above 45 millimeters mercury pressure. The pH falls below 7.35. And then we have to look at what is called compensation mechanisms. So how does our body regulate it when our pH becomes imbalanced? Well, we have what's called compensation. So some common causes of respiratory acidosis, hypoventilation. Might be due to emphysema, uh, pulmonary edema, trauma to the respiratory center and the medulla oblongata, obstruction of the airway, someone can't breathe, all sorts of things prevent you from breathing correctly and CO2 builds up in the blood. Now, when the pH drops and is due to the, the lungs not doing their job correctly, the kidneys have to take over and correct the situation. So in respiratory acidosis, in a normal individual, the kidneys will try and compensate and bring the pH back to normal, and that's called a renal compensation. So if the blood pH is too low, that means we're too acidic, the kidneys are going to try and excrete more acid out in urine, hydrogen. It will also try to reabsorb more buffer in the form of bicarbonate. So by getting rid of hydrogen in urine and reabsorbing more buffer, the pH is going to come back to normal. So you know if someone is in compensation because their pH will be normal. And for a small amount of time, in respiratory acidosis, the PCO2 will still be high. So if this, if this value is still high, but the pH is normal, that means the kidneys are doing their job and you're in compensation, renal compensation. On the other hand, in respiratory alkalosis, when the PCO2 falls below 35 millimeters of mercury pressure, so here's our range, 35 to 45. If we fall below 35 millimeters of mercury of pressure, the pH is going to go up. You're going to become alkaline. It's going to go above 7.45. So if you're getting rid of too much CO2, the CO2 levels fall, the pH rises, and you're in respiratory alkalosis. This can be due to hyperventilation uh, where... You might, not, you might be in an area where you don't have enough oxygen or somebody has a pulmonary disease, a cerebrovascular accident, a stroke, in other words, or during severe anxiety, you hyperventilate. Anything that's causing a disruption by hyperventilating is going to induce a respiratory alkalosis. So let's see what the kidneys do. In respiratory alkalosis, the kidneys don't want to get rid of the acid. If they got rid of more acid, you would ultimately become more alkaline. So during respiratory alkalosis, the kidneys decrease the amount of acid which is secreted in urine. They decrease the reabsorption of bicarbonate. You don't want to keep reabsorbing bicarbonate because you're going to buffer more acid in the blood, which is what we don't want to do. So they decrease, the, re, the kidneys decrease by carbonate reabsorption. And if we're in full compensation, the pH will be normal, but the PCO2 will still be low for a small amount of time, as long as the, the problem is corrected. So for a small amount of time, if the problem is corrected and you're breathing normally again, you would measure a still low PCO2, but the pH will be normal. So if the pH is normal, but the PCO2 is still low, you're in respiratory alkalosis, but you're in full, you're in compensation, renal compensation. Now, metabolic acidosis and alkalosis are due to an abnormal amount of bicarbonate. So the range of bicarbonate is 22 milliequivalents per liter up to 26 milliequivalents per liter. So this is our range, 22 to 26. So in metabolic acidosis, the bicarbonate levels fall below 22 milliequivalents per liter, and your pH drops. Now, metabolic acidosis can happen because of the loss of bicarbonate ions due to diarrhea, accumulation of acids like uh, occurs in ketosis, uh, 
that you might recognize the term ketoacidosis that some diabetics get um, or basically your body burns lipids in the absence of glucose and ketones build up or during renal failure excuse me or during renal failure so these are the conditions some of the conditions that induce metabolic acidosis and causes bicarbonate to drop um, so in metabolic acidosis the the lungs are going to try and compensate for the pH disruption and so what a person in metabolic acidosis will do is hyperventilate and if they hyperventilate they gas off or exhale out more CO2 than normal which is going to shift the pH back down I mean back up so by getting rid of CO2 remember you're getting rid of acid so by breathing more CO2 out, exhaling more CO2 out, you're getting rid of acid, and it's going to bring the pH back up to a normal range. And you know if you're in compensation in metabolic acidosis, because the pH will be normal, but the bicarbonate will still be low until the problem is corrected. So if the bicarbonate is low, but the pH is normal, you're in what's called respiratory compensation. Your patient would have metabolic acidosis, but they're in respiratory compensation. In metabolic alkalosis, the bicarbonate levels are too high. They rise above 26 milliequivalents per liter, which brings the pH above 7.45. So if your pH is above 7.45, you're in alkalosis. And if it's higher than 7.45 because we have too much bicarbonate, that's called metabolic alkalosis so this happens due to excessive vomiting uh, when someone has their stomach suctioned uh, or the use of certain diuretics and excessive take of alkaline drugs like Tums milk of magnesia and things like that when we lose the acid in our stomach our stomach cells and the mucosal lining try to produce more hydrochloric acid a byproduct of production of hydrochloric acid is bicarbonate. So if you lose the acid in your stomach through excesses vomiting or gastric suctioning or you're buffering it with alkaline drugs, your stomach's going to make more hydrochloric acid, which also produces bicarbonate that goes in the blood, and that's what makes your bicarbonate rise above 26. Now, if you're in metabolic alkalosis, you want your, your lungs to bring you back into a normal pH range, and that would be respiratory compensation. So if you're in metabolic alkalosis, you don't want to gas off your CO2 so the person will start to hypoventilate. If you're not breathing as fast, the CO2 will build up in the blood, which builds up acid in the blood and will bring the pH back down within a normal range. You know you're in respiratory compensation if the pH is normal, back, norm, back to the normal range, but the HCO3 minus or bicarbonate is still high. If your pH is normal and the bicarbonate is high, then you're in metabolic alkalosis, but in respiratory compensation. All right, so here's a little animation you can review. Please do that. Um, and let me know if you guys have any questions about acid-base balance, and I will get back to you. All right. Good luck studying.